History hasn't been fair to Billy Wilkerson. For years, a myth has lived on in romantic Hollywood lore that Bugsy Siegel is the father of modern Las Vegas. When in truth, the idea for the Flamingo was stolen and ruined by the notorious gangster who caused the project to cost six times more than its original projections. When it finally opened, it was a disaster of such catastrophic proportions that his partners in the mafia had him killed. Now it's time to set the record straight about the real man behind the Flamingo. Billy Wilkerson founded The Hollywood Reporter in 1930. It was Hollywood's first daily entertainment industry trade paper and reported on movies, studios, and personalities in a candid style. Each issue began with an editorial by Wilkerson which, at times, exposed corrupt studio practices, insider information, and the kind of things you'd expect to learn about watching TMZ or Extra. Billy's column went on to become one of the most widely read daily columns in the industry. In fact, it was reported that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a copy of the paper airmailed to him daily. Wilkerson became one of the town's most colorful and controversial figures. His method of soliciting advertising for the paper became the stuff of legend. He would literally blackmail studios to support the paper or suffer coverage blackout. Billy burned so many bridges that at one point, all of the studio heads banded together to not only stop advertising in The Hollywood Reporter, but to hold back news from the paper. When Wilkerson's reporters were barred from the lots, Billy told them to climb over the studio walls and sift through the executive's trash. It turned out to be the best thing that could have happened for the publication, as it uncovered a ton of incriminating information about studio executives and movie stars alike that Wilkerson and The Hollywood Reporter gladly reported on. Wilkerson took the financial success of The Hollywood Reporter and used it to expand his business empire. A logical move was into the high-end nightclub and restaurants industry, as it would serve two purposes. One, he could diversify his business holdings into a new enterprise, and two, they would draw the celebrities his paper reported on right to his doorstep. Never one to do anything half-assed, Wilkerson would go on to become the nation's most successful restaurant and nightclub owner. It was said that he brought Paris to Hollywood. All told, Wilkerson would go on to own the Vendum, Cafe Trocadero, the Sunset House, Ciro's, La Rue, and Le Aegon. Much of Hollywood's documented social golden era were captured in these glamorous establishments. Make no mistake, Billy earned his success. He was an insufferable workaholic, and it contributed to his five divorces. In fact, it is said that everything he did in life was to excess. He'd drink 20 Cokes a day and smoke three packs of cigarettes. He was a compulsive gambler who would work in the morning and go to the track in the afternoon. Legend has it that Wilkerson used to keep a pair of dice in his coat and a deck of cards close by. He used to bet with the patrons of his restaurant. If they won, they wouldn't have to pay. In the 1920s, Gambling and prostitution were easily available in California. After they were made illegal in the late 30s, the closest place to enjoy the recreation legally was in Nevada. Las Vegas became Wilkerson's favorite place. He would charter a plane in the morning, spend a few hours at the tables winning or losing around ten dollars or $20,000 before returning home to Hollywood. Like most gamblers, Wilkerson was superstitious. He had a rabbit's foot on his keychain that had gone bald from rubbing it so much. He also used to say Hail Marys as he rolled the dice. Wilkerson eventually came to accept that he had a problem. By the fall of 1944, his gambling debt was over $1 million and threatened to bankrupt his business. He shared his situation with friend, fellow card player, and head of 20th Century Fox studio, Joe Schneck. Joe offered a suggestion that could solve both his financial situation and potentially satisfy his compulsion for being around games of chance. Be on the other side of the table. Build a casino. If over time the only person who wins is the house, be the house. As much as Wilkerson loved Las Vegas casinos, he hated the desert. The whole thing lacked the kind of glamour and sophistication he was used to in Hollywood. It made him realize the potential a casino built like the clubs he owned on the Sunset Strip. To attract the Hollywood crowd, he knew he would need something on a grand scale, and it would need to be much more than just a casino. 
He envisioned a place unlike any Las Vegas had ever seen before. A place that not only catered to gamblers, but was an oasis to people who just wanted to relax. A luxurious home away from home with high quality shows, fine dining, and outdoor activities. In 1945, Wilkerson spotted a 33 acre lot on Highway 91. To avoid having the cost of the land artificially inflated due to the interest of a known high roller like Wilkerson, he had his attorney Greg Boutzer negotiate and purchase the property under his own name. He paid $84,000 for the land. Once the deal was done, Wilkerson summoned the designer of several of his Hollywood supper clubs, one of the hottest architects in the country, Wayne McAllister. Wilkerson wanted to build a massive complex, a luxury casino hotel with a showroom, a nightclub, restaurants, a cafe, and a health club. Outside would have private bungalows, feature amenities like a swimming pool, tennis, badminton, and handball courts, a nine-hole golf course, a shooting range, and stables housing 45 horses. When it came to the casino, Billy had some very specific ideas in mind. He was very candid about his compulsion during the design phase in an effort to tap into the psyche of a gambling addict, in an effort to build the perfect casino to encourage that behavior. In essence, he was building the perfect place for him to gamble in, an environment so perfectly tailored to a compulsive gambler's needs, it would make it nearly impossible to leave until one lost all of their money and had no choice. The concepts he developed are now considered Casino Design 101. The casino would be placed in the center of the hotel, so it would require guests to walk through it to get to any place in the resort. While common practice at the time, standing diminished the pleasure of the game for the gambler, so he mandated chairs and stools be at every table. He had custom gaming tables built with curved edges and leather cushion padding so that they would be more comfortable to play around, especially for extended periods of time. Windows would not be viewable from the casino level of the property to avoid the distraction of daylight caused to a gambler's concentration. The interior lights of the casino would always be dimmed to prevent a gambler from being able to distinguish the passage of time. Lastly, to prevent the disruption of time, Billy would not allow any wall clocks to be displayed or viewable from the casino, rationalizing that a gambler didn't want to be reminded that he had other obligations to attend to. Unlike the casual atmosphere available at other hotel casinos in the market at the time, Wilkerson would require the staff of his resort to be dressed in formal wear. Construction started on the project in November of 1945, about one year after the property was purchased. One item Wilkerson had trouble coming up with was a name for the property. It was something he usually did long before his projects were completed and usually inspired from his many travels. Since he was a big fan of exotic birds, he began going over dozens of bird names. He eventually settled on a pink bird he had seen during a trip to Florida. So a graphic designer was brought in to work on the logo and the working title for the project became the Flamingo Club. The true origin of the name along with virtually everything true about the concept for the resort, would become lost in favor of a glorified myth fabricated by Bugsy Siegel, but we'll get to that in a minute. Despite his grand vision, Wilkerson was smart enough to know that he didn't know how to run a casino, but it was common to have casino operations subcontracted out in those days for a cut of the profits as a silent partnership. So we tapped the talents of Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway, who were at the time running the El Cortez. Wilkerson was familiar with Gus and Mo because he owed them $100,000 in gambling debt. With nearly a third of the construction complete on the project, Wilkerson ran into financial trouble. In a post-World War II economy, building materials were hard to find and what you could find had overinflated prices. As a result, the cost of building the Flamingo Club skyrocketed to $1.2 million and Billy didn't have it. He had already invested $300,000 into the project so abandoning it wasn't an option. To raise the money, he started offering discounts to those that would pay for future advertising in The Hollywood Reporter. Studio execs who didn't immediately buy into Wilkerson's new pricing structure were threatened to not have their movies reviewed by the publication. The situation became so desperate that in some cases, he would take payment in the form of surplus lumber and metal from the studios. 
However, the materials he was able to get were often of little value to the project. He hated borrowing money, but with no other option, he approached Bank of America. Bank of America initially declined his request because they had already extended him a line of credit for $200,000 the year before. Using the Hollywood Reporter as collateral, he was able to get the bank to agree to give him a loan for $600,000. Another $400,000 came from longtime friend Howard Hughes. But that still left him $200,000 short of what he needed. Out of options and patience, he decided to do what so many gamblers have tried to do, win the rest of it. Instead, as has happened to virtually every gambler who attempts to do this, no matter what TV and movies tell you, not only did he not succeed, he lost it all. So in January of 1946, the project came to a complete halt. Billy paid off everyone in cash and left the Flamingo Club project unfinished. At the same time, Mo Sedway brought Wilkerson's project to the attention of Meyer Lansky and proposed that it could be a unique opportunity for the mafia to expand their legitimate business ventures. In 1946, many believed Meyer Lansky to be one of the heads, if not the head, of the syndicate organized crime, the mafia, or whatever you want to call it. Meyer was said to have taken over for Lucky Luciano, who was deported to Italy and barred from returning to the U.S. because of convictions related to running organized crime operations. It took some convincing, but eventually Lansky saw the potential of a grand project like this and decided to invest. The group sent a representative to make Wilkerson an offer. In February of 1946, a man walked up to Wilkerson and said he was from a New York firm interested in investing in the property. In exchange for funding, Wilkerson would give up two-thirds ownership in the project. While he was very interested in the proposal, Wilkerson demanded to remain in creative control as well as retain complete ownership of the land. Both conditions were agreed upon. When the Flamingo Club opened, Wilkerson would be the sole owner and manager of the property. His new investors wanted to be silent partners in the casino. When asked how much he would need to complete the project, Wilkerson quoted $1 million. On February 26, 1946, after sitting dormant for a month, Wilkerson received $1 million and a one-year deadline to complete the project. Fully funded and in complete creative control, it finally seemed like there was nothing that could prevent Wilkerson's dream casino from becoming a reality. One month after construction resumed, Mo and Gus brought Benjamin Bugsy Siegel to the construction site. Bugsy was introduced as the person Meyer appointed to keep an eye on the syndicate's new investment. Working with organized crime and these sorts of arrangements was nothing new to Wilkerson. He owned a speakeasy for a time in the 20s during Prohibition. He relied heavily on gangsters for the booze that kept him in business. Not to mention, Billy's gambling vice of course brought him into regular contact with reputed mobsters. At first, Siegel had no interest in any assignment that took him to Vegas on a permanent basis. He had just recently moved out to Beverly Hills and was enjoying the lifestyle it afforded him. But Bugsy was a natural choice to oversee the project. First, he already knew Wilkerson. In fact, he lived a few houses down from him in Beverly Hills. The two even knew each other before that. When Siegel came to Hollywood, he wanted to be an actor. Known for being quite vain, he also only enjoyed the best of the best. And that is exactly what Wilkerson's clubs and restaurants were known for. Throughout the spring of 1946, Wilkerson and Siegel met almost every day. In the beginning, Siegel was eager to help in any way that he could. Bugsy was able to obtain black market building materials and seemed interested in learning everything he could about the project. But at some point, just being a helper wasn't enough. Bugsy wanted a more active role in the project. Like a parent looking for something to busy a petulant child with and out of trouble while the grown-ups talked, Billy agreed to give Bugsy a more hands-on role and told him he could supervise the hotel construction. That apparently translated into having permission to start making changes to the plans, some conflicting with the blueprints. When those changes were questioned by work crews, Siegel informed them Wilkerson put him in charge. Once word got to Billy, he was furious and confronted Siegel about it. Bugsy apologized for overstepping his boundaries, but went right back to doing whatever he wanted when Wilkerson turned his back. In addition, 
he began sowing the seeds of discontent, complaining about his role on the project, referring to it as little more than a watchdog. In an attempt to prevent any more interferences slowing down the project, as well as provoking one of his already legendary temper tantrums, Wilkerson split the project into two very distinctive halves. Each half would have its own crew and little or no communication with each other because at this point, neither really wanted to have anything to do with the other. But instead of being grateful, Bugsy became competitive. He even started telling everyone who would listen that the flamingo was his idea. And the made-up story of his epiphany in the desert was born, complete with details that didn't seem to make any sense or based anyway, in fact. Like how he came up with the name Flamingo for the property. Bugsy claimed Flamingo was the nickname he had for his girlfriend at the time, Virginia Hill, given to her because of her long skinny legs. However, no one seems to recall hearing Bugsy referring to Virginia with this nickname before or after the story was invented. More important than Bugsy's need for attention was his reckless spending. Bugsy spent all the money allocated to complete the hotel within a month of the new split crew deal and even had the audacity to demand more from Wilkerson's budget, a request that was refused. While Wilkerson was alarmed at Bugsy's reckless spending, he knew better than to poke the bear. Instead, Wilkerson did what he could to appease Bugsy, hoping it was only a matter of time before the powers that sent him to Vegas to oversee the project would take notice and fire him, or at least remove him from the project. Not only did this not happen, things got worse. Bugsy started to see Wilkerson as an obstacle in the way of his project. In May of 1946, Bugsy decided to make it official. He informed Wilkerson that the original agreement giving him all the creative power and primary ownership of the project was over. A new deal transferring that power to Bugsy would replace it. He offered to buy out Wilkerson's creative participation with corporate stock in Bugsy's new company, the Nevada Project Corporation of California, in which Bugsy was the president and everyone else was just a stockholder. Continuing to believe that eventually Bugsy Superior would see what he was doing and put a stop to it, Billy agreed. In worst case scenario, per his agreement with the bosses, he would still be the property manager once the place opened. And once it opened, there would be no need for Bugsy as a watchdog with Gus and Moe around to run things. With nothing to do until the project was finished, Wilkerson decided to head back to Hollywood. Flamingo was now Bugsy's to do with whatever he wanted. First thing he did, fire all of Wilkerson's on-site associates, replacing them with his guys. He also made girlfriend Virginia Hill responsible for interior decorating. With Billy gone and Bugsy calling all the shots, it became clear to everyone involved that he didn't know the first thing about building a large resort. And spending continued to soar out of control, with plans continuing to change all the time. Suddenly, things like marble wasn't good enough. Bugsy wanted the most expensive Italian marble available. He ordered each of the 90 available rooms at the Flamingo to have their own private plumbing and sewer system, a decision that cost $1.5 million alone, more money than Wilkerson received to finish building the entire project. Bugsy's plans not only slowed the progress of the project, in some cases, it set it back. For example, to handle the new plumbing plans, they would need to replace the boiler room they already had with a larger one, costing $29,000. And now they had an extra boiler they had no use for. Already completed portions of the project were torn down and rebuilt to accommodate Bugsy's out of the blue ideas. He had a concrete wall torn down and replaced with an enormous plate of glass so gamblers could have a view of the pool while they were playing. Adding to soaring costs of the project were dishonest contractors. Upset over not being paid when Bugsy had money problems, they would deliver materials, then steal them at night and resell them to Siegel a few days later. And Bugsy was oblivious to the operation. In fact, he couldn't even keep his attention on the task of finishing construction on the Flamingo. He became fixated on the deal that allowed Wilkerson to retain ownership of the land he was building on. So he approached Wilkerson and offered more corporate stock in exchange for it. Clearly not understanding how owning a company worked, 
Wilkerson agreed to sell half of the land for an additional 5% stake in Bugsy's new company. Bugsy agreed, then became obsessed with getting the rest of the land. So Billy agreed to sell for another 5% ownership. At 48%, the exchange made Wilkerson the single largest shareholder in the company that owned the Flamingo and the land it resided upon. Bugsy essentially paid Billy to become the primary owner of the Flamingo again. By October of 1946, the cost of the Flamingo was at $4 million, and Bugsy was out of money again. And the syndicate refused to give him any more money until they saw the books. Bugsy knew that finishing the project as fast as possible so he could open and start generating revenue was his only chance at reprieve. Desperate for a cash infusion, he pressured Wilkerson to sign a bank loan for $600,000. This, after reassuring Billy when he sold the rest of the land to Bugsy, he wouldn't need to make any more financial investments to the project. But Billy knew if the project fell into bankruptcy, he would lose his entire investment, so he agreed. After quickly running through that money, Bugsy started selling non-existing stock to new investors. Racing to finish as quickly as possible, Bugsy paid over and double time. He even promised bonuses tied to project deadlines. Siegel became so desperate to start generating revenue that he moved the grand opening of the Flamingo from the original March 1st, 1947 date to the day after Christmas, 1946. Even though we knew the hotel would not be ready by then, and despite Wilkerson's vehement argument against a holiday opening. Trying to make the best of a bad situation, in December of 1946, Wilkerson began helping to market the property in preparation for the hotel's gala opening. Two weeks before the opening, Bugsy called a stockholders meeting. Only Bugsy and Billy were in attendance. With lawyers for both parties present, Bugsy admitted that he oversold the company by 150%. He informed Billy that he needed to give up all of his stock in Bugsy's company and that he would not be compensated for it. When Wilkerson's lawyer refused, Bugsy became enraged and threatened to kill Wilkerson. Bugsy said, if I don't deliver the interest to the people in the East, I'm going to be killed. Before I go, you're going to go first. Accepting that Bugsy's threat was real and on the advice of his lawyer, Wilkerson left Las Vegas that night. And while he headed back to L.A., that was only to get his things, before he jumped on a flight to New York, then took a ship to France, where he hid out under a fake name at the Hotel George V. All future communications between the two would be through lawyers. As one would expect from a compulsive gambler, ever the optimist, even after all this, Billy still believed that once Bugsy's bosses found out how much he had overspent, they would remove him from the project and reinstate Billy. Until then, he would wait it out, in hiding, in Paris. In an attempt to accelerate the process, he began publishing how much the Flamingo project cost in the Hollywood Reporter. A few days after the Flamingo opened, Billy received a report on how things went. It was a disaster, the worst the city of Las Vegas had ever seen. Here's why. First. People didn't know when it was opening. Its opening date was originally promoted as December 26th. But Siegel changed his mind before sending the invitations out and moved it to Saturday, December 28th, only to change his mind again and switch it back to the 26th. Guests were notified via phone. With the promise of more celebrities than they had ever seen, locals flooded the property. But the celebrities Bugsy promise never arrived mostly because the two TWA planes Howard Hughes loaned Billy for the opening were grounded due to bad weather. The guests that did come were greeted with the sound of construction still underway. And to make matters worse, the modern air conditioning system, advertised as the first resort in the desert to have it, broke down regularly. After two weeks, the Flamingo was $275,000 in the red. Gambling losses were exacerbated largely due to the fact that the property had no rooms to keep people at the property after hours. When Bugsy shut the property down in late January 1947, he blamed everything on Wilkerson. While closed, he spent another $750,000 just to finish the project. 
In February of 1947, after a lot of pressure from his lawyer and tired of living in exile, Wilkerson accepted that the Flamingo would never be his. So he offered to sell his interest in the property for $2 million. He also insisted that a signed agreement be completed releasing him from any further obligations to the corporation. After a series of negotiations, Billy ended up only getting $600,000 for his shares. He reasoned the money didn't really matter compared to the value of his life. On March 1st, 1947, the renamed Fabulous Flamingo reopened. March 19th, the first of two payments was made to Wilkerson for his shares in the Nevada Project. A week later, Wilkerson returned to Hollywood. However, a few days after that, he was contacted by an anonymous woman who informed Wilkerson that her husband, recently paroled, had been contracted to kill him. She begged Billy to leave the country because she didn't want her husband to go back to jail. 48 hours later, Wilkerson was back in Paris. In late April, Wilkerson's attorney confirmed that his interest in the Flamingo had been transferred. Feeling relieved, Billy decided to enjoy Paris for a few weeks before returning home. He even let it be known where he was. While Billy was enjoying a long-deserved vacation, Siegel was back in Vegas trying to convince his partners to give him more time. Flamingo appeared to be turning the corner, and in May, finally showed a profit. But it was too little too late. It had become clear just how mismanaged the entire project was and that it was all Bugsy's fault. In late May, Billy was preparing to return home for good when his Hollywood office received an anonymous call advising your employer to stay in Paris until it was over, then hung up. Billy heeded the warning and went back into lockdown. Nearly two months later, June 21st, Wilkerson bought a newspaper, sat down at a sidewalk cafe, and opened it up to see that Bugsy Siegel was dead. Billy returned to the States two days later. Minutes after Bugsy was killed, Wilkerson's original partners, Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum, took possession of the Flamingo. When Bugsy didn't produce a detailed accounting of the goings-on at the Flamingo Project, the syndicate launched their own investigation. They uncovered that Bugsy oversold the property by as much as 400%. His bosses were enraged that the property that Wilkerson promised to deliver for $1 million ended up costing $6 million under Bugsy Siegel. The Flamingo was the most expensive hotel ever built in the world at that time. Fortunately, with new management in place, Flamingo finally lived up to its potential and was a huge financial success. However, it wouldn't do it by being anything like the elegant place Wilkerson envisioned it to be. The dress code was dropped and the Flamingo became a non-exclusive resort with affordable prices. With Mo and Gus in charge, the Flamingo turned a $4 million profit in the first year. As time went on, other Vegas properties opened more in line with what Billy had in mind for the Flamingo, and as expected, drew the market Billy said it would. Even though Wilkerson would return to Vegas many times after this experience, he never once stayed at the Flamingo. In October of 1951, it was fatherhood that gave Wilkerson the inspiration to kick his gambling habit. He quit cold turkey when his son was born. Wilkerson would run The Hollywood Reporter up until the day he died. On September 2nd, 1962, Billy died of a heart attack at the age of 71, one day before The Hollywood Reporter's 32nd anniversary. Bugsy is closer to the idiot that comes to Vegas with the family's nest egg and loses everything than a casino visionary. It is true that the Flamingo that opened in 1946 was Bugsy's Flamingo and not Billy's. Virtually every bad idea and problem the property had should all be credited to Bugsy for bastardizing the concept Wilkerson tried to bring to Las Vegas ahead of its time. In the end, Billy took his gambling addiction and used it to establish concepts that have become institutions in casinos around the world to this day. However, Billy Wilkerson still has never gotten the credit he deserves. Oh well, at least Bugsy got the credit he deserved. <laughs> <laughs>